Hello and welcome to Hear These Words, a podcast from Good Shepherd Episcopal Church in Tequesta, Florida. I'm Derek Larson, the Associate Rector here at Good Shepherd. I'm Sanford Groff, I'm the Rector. Each week on the podcast, we discuss the passages of Scripture assigned for the upcoming Sunday. And this week, the upcoming Sunday is Easter Sunday. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord, March 31st, 2024. And the words we hear are from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Psalm 118, verses 1 through 2, and verses 14 through 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, and the Gospel of Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. It makes you want to say that A word, but we're still in Lent. We're still in well, Lent. As in of this week, recording, Lent, yes. we're in Holy Week. So we're going to hold off from saying um, the A word. that classic Hebrew praise God word. Right. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, we were just we were talking yesterday about uh, whether you prefer Christmas or Easter. Yes, and um, I really love not just Easter but, but Holy, Holy Week, Week. right? The like whole all, thing. all together, right? Right. Um, it's a lot of work, right? But uh, I love it. It makes me feel like we are full time Christians, right? Right. If that right. makes any right. sense. But I know we're just so, walking with Jesus. Right. right. We're Living supposed to life. always be full time Christians, right. but but we live in a world where like we get distracted by other things and mm. and uh you know, we gotta go to work and uh, of course you and me, we work here at the church. Right, but right. but still you're you're thinking about a lot of administrative things and you're mm-hmm. thinking about all you know and you have to remind yourself to like, oh yeah, like we've got to pray and we've got to do. Right. But on Holy Week, we've just got so many services that, um, you know, it gives me a glimpse. Sometimes I imagine what life would have been like if I had been a monk. <laughs> and right. while I don't feel called to be a monk, <laughs> it's fun to imagine sometimes. And right. Holy Week kind of gives you a glimpse of like, what would it be like to worship in community every day right. rather than just once a week. I have a feeling most of our viewers or watchers are able to understand exactly what you're saying. I have a feeling there is a large portion of the population who would say, who would get excited yeah. about possibly <laughs> being a monk? Because um, I, I actually think it's, as priests, we do, if you, if you looked at a pie chart of our time spent, right, for instance, you would still get a nice chunk of time, you and I, get a nice chunk of time in scripture, in prayer, Mm -hmm. in worship, um, you know, basically doing, (laughs) living our faith, uh, so to speak, which is, I think, I hope, you know, in part why why we became priests. So I feel, actually, I feel kind of uh, sympathy at some level for the laity, right? The people who are not ordained, who are not right. deacons, priests, monks, or, or bishops, um, but but who feel and who are living their life and they they have to carve out, you know, it really intentionally carve out time yeah. to live their faith. And mm-hmm. that might be quietly by themselves at their house or on their drive or at their work. It might be coming to church on Sunday or right. if they're able to come for a, a program during the week. Um, but in general, that part of their life might be quite quite small. Right. And so Holy Week, um, well, you and I probably get very excited because it's a lot. It's just a lot of Jesus walking, faith yeah. living. Yeah. Um, I bet lay people maybe get excited as well. Except that I have a feeling it's more, even maybe a little more stressful for lay people mm. at a different level, uh, because they they've actually got to try to carve that time out of their of their busy lives, right, right, and their work life and their family life, and now you've got church on Thursday night and Friday night and Saturday night, and mm-hmm. no, get up on Sunday and get over, but um, yeah, but that's it's a great joy, it's a great joy. I the one thing I want to say about Lent, I think I told you this earlier. Um, is that I gave up, you know, I gave up. I'm fasting from sweets. Right. I have a long list of exceptions to my sweets, like <laughs> cereal. I'm not fasting from cereal. So I've had rice, or I've had a Reese's Puffs cereal. I don't know if you know what that is, but mm-hmm. okay. That's, you do You do have that's a... That's pretty sweet. You do have a seven-year-old, right? Or yeah, yeah. Year old. So anyway. Um, <clears throat> to who? I'm... I'm um, I wish... I don't really wish this. I feel like at the end of 40 days, I should not want to go back. I should just, like, cookies and brownies, mm. and that just doesn't do it for You've me. You've learned that you don't need I've them. learned that I don't need it. I'm yeah. fine. I feel good. Right. right? 
But on Easter that's, morning, that's not I'm having case. a cinnamon roll. <laughs> I, I am, I am uh, sorry. It just well, if there's any day for a cinnamon roll, Easter morning. Easter is, morning is great. Yeah, <laughs> I've always wanted to make hot cross buns. Yeah, but I don't. I have never done it. So if you've got a good recipe out there, hot cross buns. Yeah, let me know. Maybe this is the year for it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, well, okay. before we get into it, I also you you had mentioned just how. Um, how much of a commitment and how difficult it is for folks that do not work at the church to mm -hmm. be at these services. And um, I, I want to, in particular, express my gratitude for all of the volunteers mm -hmm. that are making Holy Week possible. Mm -hmm. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, the Stations of the Cross, um, all, you know, all the things that we're doing this week and then Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. um, there are people that are serving um, at even multiple today. services, even, even today, yeah, uh, today Wednesday, um, yeah. that we're recording this. So um, I am so grateful for all of the volunteers that are showing up at these mm -hmm. services multiple times, and uh, there are there are folks that will be at multiple Easter services because mm -hmm. they're serving in different capacities mm -hmm. at each mm -hmm. one. So, and I echo that. Thanks. Yeah, yes, I great. echo that, and uh, and and strongly thank. You know, probably over a hundred. You know, probably there are over a hundred oh, yeah. people um, who are involved. Doing, yeah, who are mm -hmm. doing that mm -hmm. at different levels. So yep. it's um, that's the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we mm -hmm. couldn't we couldn't do it on our own. No, yeah, that's Thanks great. Really. That's nor great. do we. Nor does anyone want us to do no. it on our own. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, our passages for today. Um, there are, you know, if, if folks are following with uh, lectionary websites or with the prayer book. Uh, if you look up the readings for Easter Sunday, there are lots of options mm -hmm. um, from year to year. And uh, and so um, we've picked the ones that we're going to focus mm -hmm. on this year. So um, and, and that begins with Acts. So our first <clears throat> reading is going to be from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. I, I always um, am a little uh, interested uh, and curious about often in the season of Easter, we don't have a reading from the Old Testament. Mm. Instead, we read from the book of Acts mm -hmm. instead of the Old Testament. So mm -hmm. this whole season, we don't, don't actually read from the Hebrew Scriptures except for the Psalms. Mm. And so this this Sunday, since we are starting with the books of Acts, we're actually starting that rhythm. Um, but Acts is, a, is a, a great story that is birthed out of the resurrection story. And so this week, we get the story of Peter's response to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. And uh, there's this miraculous story about how God speaks to Peter in a dream about going to speak to this Gentile family. And at the same time, God speaks to this Gentile family and tells them to go and get Peter to speak to you. Uh, it's almost like a supernatural um coincidence type thing that both of them are hearing the voice of God about each other. Mm. And so Peter does come and speak to them and Cornelius and the other Gentiles share about their experience and, and that God is doing something and wants uh, Peter to speak to them. And so our passage today is the words that Peter speaks to Cornelius and the other Gentiles, this family. And uh, it begins, I truly understand that God shows no partiality but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And then he goes through the uh, the story of Jesus and and uh, uh, the story of the resurrection and how uh, after the third day that that Jesus was raised, he began to uh, appear to his disciples and others that were chosen to be witnesses, um, folks that ate and drank with Jesus. Uh, and then how Jesus commanded those people that he appeared to, to preach to the people and to testify that Jesus is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. So we get kind of two things happening here. One, we get the story of, of the gospel, that Jesus describes the death and resurrection of Jesus and his appearances and great commissioning of them to go and proclaim that gospel. Mm -hmm. But we get that as part of a narrative mm -hmm. that is really about inclusion and not showing partiality, um, which we had a Bible study uh, not long ago, I think in, in uh, November, uh, October, November, 
time that, that the book of Acts really is about how the wideness of God's mercy starts small in, in Jerusalem and then it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the narrative that we're jumping into here starts with that line. Mm-hmm. God shows no partiality mm-hmm. because this story is a story about how God is uh, becoming intimately involved in even a Gentile family who mm-hmm. are not Jews and do not follow all of the laws. And yet here they are. And Peter's surprised by that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet Peter steps out in faith. So we could focus just on Peter's words of the gospel mm-hmm. story, or we could focus on that whole narrative of, of inclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot here, and I really um, I love this story. It, it's a story that goes over the course of uh, a few chapters. And so um, it might be something that folks want to pull out their Bibles and go right. through the whole chapter 10 and, and chapter 11. Right. I think, I think one of the things that is, you know, both from a lectionary perspective, so the fact that this is one of the options for Easter Day principally, mm-hmm. but also that this is setting up for lack of a better term, the Christian ethos. And, and what I mean by that is, um, really at the, end, at the end of the para- passage, um, you know, that, that, that we are witnesses and we are to preach and to testify. Mm. You know, we, are, we have witnessed this miraculous resurrection event. We've, we've witnessed the Jesus story in the flesh. And, and as witnesses now, our mandate is to preach and to testify. Mm-hmm. And by the way, um, Peter adds, all the prophets, all the prophets testify about yeah. him. Um, that, you know, and, and, and so not only do you have this forward-looking mandate for us to preach and testify, but you're supported by the great cloud of witnesses that come you know, from, from before. Yeah. And I think that that's uniquely Christian. Um, in this, I, I I don't think that's you know a Jewish kind of holdover uh, from their from their Jewish history or, or, or identity um, uh, in terms of in terms of Peter, uh, but rather that that in Christianity there's this you know and we would we would kind of talk about evangelism right I mean that would be the more but but that carries with it a lot of modern day things that I think that's not quite what I'm where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. My, my, my sense is that Jesus' story, Jesus' Holy Week death, and then Jesus' resurrection on Easter is not confined to Jesus alone. Right. That that's something that we share in and that we have access to and that we, in our own stories, in our own lives, deaths, we experience God's loving resurrection mm-hmm. um, bit by bit kind of in fits and starts when when we can when we can see it but then the point in that is not simply to you know as jesus says kind of hide your hide your light under a bushel basket right but to let it shine and to proclaim that god has done something with the world Mm -hmm. that is as you have i think rightly pointed out accessible to all Mm -hmm. you know that this is a rat a message of radical inclusivity Mm -hmm. um because it applies, uh, it applies to everyone. Mm-hmm. So how do we, you know, I think, I think it's one thing to look at Easter. I think I'm preaching on Sunday, so mm-hmm. it'll be my first Easter sermon. Uh, as the associate, I never preached on Easter. Oh, okay. So this will be my, you've, you've preached on yeah, Easter. Yeah, in a sense. You've pre- preached. Because we didn't have a rector. You didn't have a rector, right. right. So no. I've, I, I, 10 years of priest, I've never, right. I've never preached The rector Easter. generally preaches on Easter. That's right. Often does, so yeah. Right. Great. Well, we'll see. <laughs> but, and we were talking about this a little earlier, but, you know, to what extent in a homily do we simply look and focus our eyes on Jesus? Yeah. But I think what I'm hearing from Peter today in Acts is, okay, but also as you look to Jesus resurrected, but then you turn to look back at your life, the work, the family, the obligations, the commitments, the duties, the schedules... <laughs> How do you embody that resurrection to then preach and proclaim that mm-hmm. and to testify to what you witnessed on this Easter? Right. So we'll see. Yeah. 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 That's great. The psalm appointed is Psalm uh, 118 verses 1 through 2 and verses 14 through 24. 
and it is a psalm of thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim his mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory in the tents of the righteous. And it continues kind of giving all of these celebratory and victorious and triumphal statements. Verse 17, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Uh, Verse 19, open for me the gates of righteousness and I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. And then uh, in verse 22, Mm -hmm. the same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day, the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This was written centuries before Jesus' resurrection, Mm -hmm. but it is a classic Easter psalm anyway. And um, it it feels like it could have been written for um, Easter Sunday with Mm -hmm. all of the celebration, victory, um, Mm -hmm. and... um, and you've got, I mean, again, I, my ears, I, 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 maybe I'm just, I miss hear things, but the same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's the, the great reversal of God, the great taking that which, you know, the world has no use for, the, the, the you know, how, how Jesus's vision of the world can seem so counterintuitive, and yet, in God's economy, that's actually the very foundation upon which mm-hmm. the whole rest of the whole rest of uh, things uh, exist. Yeah, um, you, you did a great job today at at, at, at Children's Chapel uh, with the with the idea of um, you know that love is more powerful than fear. You know mm-hmm. that we don't have to be afraid because of God's love, yep. and how in Easter we we get to see love. Um, even in the midst of fear, right? That, yep. that fear doesn't necessarily go away right. in our lived experience, right. but that but that God's love is greater than that, and it puts all of our fears into the right perspective. Exactly. Um, yeah. But I, I, I just I think twenty two again. It's a pretty famous verse, and um, and it remi- it just reminds me of God's great reversal. Mm-hmm. And I think it was used by the early Christians. Uh, the chief cornerstone. Uh, is the stone that the builders rejected. It's, it was used um, by the Apostle Paul, I think, and other early Christians to kind of point to Jesus, that mm-hmm. Jesus was one rejected mm. and yet became the foundation or was the foundation mm-hmm. of um, this transformative moment in in cosmic history, really. Mm. Um, and I think that there's a really beautiful message there uh, for uh, for those that are rejected among us Mm. in our society, those who are marginalized and those who are on the edges of society, that that's that's where Jesus came from. Mm -hmm. And that was Jesus's experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. so there's a powerful message there as well. The second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, a classic passage on the resurrection from Paul. And it begins, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you've come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I'm the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. (laughs) Paul, Paul, 
He so so I'm laughing because I'm laughing because he goes through this litany, right, of 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 the message, the kind of the telephone game of Jesus's resurrection. And of course he puts himself last and that's, you know, and that's fine and he's doing it to prove kind of a greater point, which is I'm I I'm the I'm the lowliest of them all. I've gotten the message last and yet I've come, you know, to this place by the grace of God where I I'm out out front, you know, I'm I'm ready to be totally out front even though I persecuted the church and all this kind of stuff. Um I'm laughing not only because of the way that he kind of not only because of the way that he lists, you know, appear to Cephas, then to the twelve, then to the but um because he forgot the women. Oh, oh yeah. Well, it said, well, our translation says 500 brothers and sisters at one time, but right. it doesn't mention any of the narratives that we have in the Gospels no, right. about right. the women at the grave, right. right? And again, and again, this, this probably was written before the Gospel of Mark, which is our right. earliest uh-huh. Gospel. So, so in terms of resurrection announcements from a, from a, you know, pen to paper, or you know, mm-hmm. quilled a papyrus, whatever. <laughs> uh, this is probably er- the earliest mm. in terms of that, and so it is. In- it's just interesting, and I'm not saying you know. And this is his experience. So what he's writing here is out of how he received it, and, and what was told to him through this kind of litany of 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 messages. Um, um, the only other thing I want to say about that is that. Uh, you know, I would remind you, right? I would. He starts. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, and um, it is. It is especially when we come to this Easter, which for me, you know, this will be my forty third Easter. Um, for some of our listeners, this might be, you know, a few decades more. more. Than that, yeah. <laughs> um, we have to be reminded. I just I there's something about the nature of celebrating within a church calendar that is very very helpful. And as we were talking about the other day, you know, you got to you've got to hear something seven times um in order to kind of remember it, you know, mm-hmm. to to really to really hear it. To really hear it. Mm-hmm. And so Paul gets that. Paul Paul, you know, and and Paul's not throwing any shade on them he's not you know belittling them he's just saying let me remind you again right because i i know i told you this i know that we were there and um but here it is one more time and i i think that's part of that message even that peter uh, to cornelius was (coughs) sharing which is the you know preaching and testifying of this great good news yeah And this is the beginning of a chapter about the resurrection. And most of the chapter is not actually about the resurrection of Jesus, Mm -hmm. but about the resurrection of the dead, the Mm -hmm. resurrection of all of us. Mm -hmm. And so um, what Paul is doing here at the beginning, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you. He's reminding them of the resurrection of Jesus so that they will also remember Mm -hmm. um, their own resurrection. And that they, they also will be resurrected and those that have died in their midst will also be resurrected Mm -hmm. um so it's going back to what you were pointing out in the first reading that this isn't just about jesus right it's it's about the entire community of faith that that goes forward from um from jesus and uh and so you know paul really wants to emphasize that it in the early church as well as in the time of jesus there was a lot of debate about whether the resurrection was even real Mm -hmm. was it something that would happen and uh, and throughout the Christian centuries, you know, we have um, we we've gone through various times of church history where we have de-emphasized the resurrection of the body in order to emphasize um, your soul going to heaven. Right. And uh, and and to this day, often we don't really we talk about the resurrection, but but really what we mean is when you die, your soul goes to heaven, and mm-hmm. and, and you're and you're there. Um, but Paul really you're, wants you're to... You're speaking culturally. Culturally. Like culturally. Culturally, that's kind of what we think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and not just culturally, but even in the church. That's right. often the language that we use mm-hmm. when we talk about that. Um, but biblically, um, and, and going to the writings of Paul, there really is an emphasis here 
on on tangible bodies, mm -hmm. not just a soul that's being freed from the prison of body, like right. maybe Plato, the philosopher, would talk about, right. but that God doesn't just redeem our spirits, but God redeems our whole selves, right. our whole bodies. Right. And it's a mystery as to what that looks like. Paul goes into that later in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, when he kind of has a a mock debate with himself, you know, he, mm -hmm. he anticipates what the questions are going to be that, and they, they ask, you know, but you might say, well, what will the resurrected body look like? Right. And, and Paul says, well, I don't know, but think about Jesus and his resurrected body. Um, all that to say that the, the point that I hear in this passage is that because Jesus resurrected, not just the soul of Jesus, but the body, the wholeness of mm -hmm. Jesus, um, there is a promise that God is interested not just in uh, saving our souls, mm. but in caring and resurrecting and transforming and bringing healing to our whole bodies as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And not only our bodies, but the physical, material, tangible lives that we live, mm -hmm. including this whole world. You know, mm -hmm. For right. me, uh, stewardship of the earth, taking care of the planet, um, is an Easter action. Mm -hmm. It's an Easter proclamation mm -hmm. because... Easter tells us, as well as Christmas, that God cares about our bodies and God cares about the material world. Right. And so Paul here, we're, we're only getting the first part of this passage, but Paul here is saying, because God cared about Jesus's whole body mm -hmm. and spirit, God also cares about you right. and your whole body and spirit. God's not just interested in what's going on in the heart. God is very interested in that. Right. But God is interested in how what's happening in the heart affects, you know, your material life. Mm -hmm. the, the, the life that you are living in this body and in this material right. world. Right. What happens to Jesus has implications for what happens to us. Right. Is it, I think it's Romans 8, right? The creation groans yeah. with longing and, you know, for the but then it will be kind of... I don't think the word is resurrect. I can't quote it off the top of my head, but it, it, it will be um, redeemed right. along, you know, all of creation will mm -hmm. be redeemed in Christ's resurrection. And so that, that, you know, Paul is pretty consistent with this point. Yeah. And, um, and uh, the only thing I would say from a secular perspective, both culturally, scientifically and maybe philosophically i think the pendulum has swung back to bodies a little bit more that, hmm. that we are our bodies yeah. you know would be something that would be more familiar in this day and age than maybe 200 years ago mm -hmm. where where we don't you know um you know we used to have this kind of split between body and soul or body and mind and the ability you know the descartian kind of i think therefore i am kind of idea that we right. can exist without our body right um i would say just again anecdotally that that there seems to be a, a gr much greater emphasis on realizing that we are bodies and that i <clears throat> theologically would would you know support what you're saying to say that and in heaven you know we are bodies too, you know, yeah. and, and our body will be a resurrected body, right. but it's not, we're not some floating soul. Right. Now I was, t I was chatting with Bible study about this a couple of weeks ago. I don't think you were there. Yeah. And a couple of them had a hard time with this idea. They, well, it's just my soul. I just kind of always imagine my soul, yeah. which how you imagine your soul. I don't know, but, but um, yeah. it, 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 you can see where, uh, what we've what what we've had for many 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 thou uh, hundreds or maybe even thousand years has influenced the church's thinking on this, and it's right. made passages like uh, you know the whole chapter of First Corinthians fifteen uh, hard harder to swallow as we try to imagine. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But practically speaking, there's a lot of things we can do today in our our own time mm -hmm. that um, keeps those together, yeah. both body and creation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I encourage our listeners to go read the full chapter. Yeah, good. The full chapter of Resurrection. You've got I, homework. Yep. Yeah, and then you can ask me about my tattoo, which good. my my first tattoo is inspired on 1 Corinthians 15. So we can talk about that. It's good. 
Uh, Maybe we should do like, a, you know, we're always thinking of programming here. We could just go through and have a, a five part series on Father Derek's tattoos. <laughs> I don't think I have enough tattoos. Do you have a five part series in there? We have like I a have, three part or? I have four tattoos right now. So, so four, uh, that's a, a four solid, series. we could do like sure. an advent, an advent <laughs> program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Write to the associate if you'd like that. Don't don't ask me. That. Okay. Yeah, let's go. I I don't have any, so I, I can't I can't offer such services to the church. And then we'll have to we'll have to have we can have an intro series or an intro session on what the Bible says about tattoos. Yes. Because uh, you know that's a big conversation that has been in the church too, whether right. you should get tattoos or not. Right. And I'm sure right. that there are folks at our church that probably don't like tattoos, They're, but yeah, um, I, yeah. they don't, they seem not to mind a tattooed priest. So right. I, I, I'm grateful for that. <laughs> so our gospel reading, um, where we're all centered, Mark chapter 16, verses one through eight. Um, so, you know, this is the shortest uh, of the gospels. Mm -hmm. This is the most direct and concise of the gospels. And that is no less true of the resurrection story. Hmm. It begins when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they said to, the other, to one another, well, who's going to roll away the stone? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was large, had already been rolled back. And then as they entered there, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed by that, but the man said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus, who is crucified, but he's been raised, and he's not here. This is the place where they laid him. But now go and tell the disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you'll see him, just as he told you. So the women went out and fled the tomb, for, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid." So that's the end of our pericope here. Um, you want to say more about the end of the gospel? I do. Okay. I, do, I mean, I just feel like we have to, yeah. right? Uh -huh. I mean, so <sighs> textual criticism, I guess, source criticism. Uh -huh. um, um, this, this, is, this is where the earliest manuscripts end, Mark. That there's not... For they were afraid. Done. End of book. The book is over. End of the whole story. The, the whole story. The whole There's yep. not a Mark chapter 17, right? Which means that there is no appearance of the resurrected Jesus. There's no post-resurrection appearance, correct. They, they, they say that it's going to happen, but right. in Mark, in the earliest version, in the earliest versions, there, you don't, you don't actually see it. Now, fast forward 200 years, right? So if this is written around 50 to 80, somewhere in there, 80, 70 to 60, 80. 60, yeah, somewhere in there. Somewhere around there. I can't be bothered with decades. You, know. <laughs> um, um, you fast forward maybe two hundred years, uh, maybe a hundred years, and one hundred fifty years, and you get a longer version, a longer ending that starts to show up in the in the manuscripts. So now we're talking two um, hundreds, you know, somewhere around there. I'd have to look, and there you do get a, a, a bit of a you get almost a whole chapter right. worth of material. Mm -hmm. Then, if you fast forward another 200 years, you get a, a shorter ending of Mark that's very short. It's only, um, you know, we're looking it up, it's only, uh, you know, two verses. Oh, uh, yep. Uh, basically yeah. one verse. Ba basically a verse. And... Um, it basically, and that came around around the four hundreds. If I if I'm reading my my uh, my textual criticism correct, so so as you pointed out, which I appreciate, um, it's all included in your Bible. It should all be there, and you might have little notes in your Bible. So we we can deal with all of that. But one way to interpret this particular passage that we have for Easter Sunday is to say. It ends with, for they were afraid. Mm -hmm. And to just sit with that, right? Mm -hmm. to, 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 to sit with, you know, John gives us other, you know, John, Matthew, and, and Luke all give us post-resurrection appearances. But in Mark, it really leaves us with a cliffhanger. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I, I actually kind of like a cliffhanger sometimes in, you know, books and, and movies and, and TV shows and theater. I, I like... A cliffhanger for me leaves it up to, to my 
up to where I am, yeah. right? And my it forces me to engage with the story. And so they they run they run out, they're terrified, amazement had seized them, they were not and they said nothing to anyone. And again, you know, and for they were afraid. Um, and the question then becomes, you know, what's my experience, you know, as the reader? What's my experience as the faithful? How do I where do I come out on this? And I think, you know, this earliest version of Mark that again, if we, you know, we could we could deal with the other two endings and that we we'd have to have a different time for that. We don't have time for that today. But is um is is this idea then that that this ends with with them being afraid. Mm-hmm. And it almost poses the question to me, you know, are you gonna be afraid too? Mm-hmm. You know, are you kind of back to your sermon with the kids today, the students, you know, will you let fear uh kind of overtake love? Yeah. Or or are you gonna cling to that and let love uh win the day? Mm-hmm. A couple of other just really well. Actually, we'll, let me pause. I'll come back to my other two quick notes. Just very small. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, it is a very perplexing ending, um, and it makes you wonder what the author's intent was, or if there is something missing. Particularly, not just because it ends on a note of fear, but it ends here uh, in verse seven. The man, who we presume to be an angel, although it doesn't say that, um, says, "Go." Tell his disciples and Peter, I don't know why Peter is singled out there, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he, Jesus, is going ahead of you to Galilee. And then in verse 8, it says, They went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone. Right. For they were afraid. And so it actually <laughs> ends on on them disobeying mm-hmm. Uh, the angel who proclaimed to them the resurrection of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so no wonder in some of the um, later additions to Mark, they're trying to play with and solve this perplexing um, premature ending that Mark has written mm-hmm. and, and, and give a little bit of a sense. So, so the intermediate or the shorter ending of Mark then continues and all that that, and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. So mm-hmm. there, the very next line, right. someone wrote in. Actually, they did. They did they tell did Peter, and they right. did tell. Right. And maybe they did. Maybe they yes. didn't. But but uh, it's always great to remember that these gospel writers are also authors, mm-hmm. and they have a literary uh, objective mm-hmm. in their writing. Mm-hmm. And to have a cliffhanger like this. Um, it gives an invitation to the listener and to the reader um, to write the next chapter. Mm-hmm. And and so the question is, will you also be silent? Or you, right. as you framed it, will you be afraid? Will you right. let fear right. win? Will you also be silent? Right. Or will you take on this message and will you proclaim it? Right. Right. Uh, right. So uh, it's a very perplexing in, uh, ending. And yet it's a very effective ending mm-hmm. because... It, it forces us to write the next chapter. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, just as I'm sitting here thinking back through my, you know, history of Easter's, I have left Easter silent and afraid. Yeah. Right? I mean, and whether that was on Sunday at 1201 or whatever, but or whether that was during the 50 days of Easter, mm-hmm. both and, right? But, but I, but I have not, you know, I have, I have not uh, always left Easter with joy and gratitude in my heart. I've left sometimes with fear in silence. Yeah. And I think that there's something about that um, in, our, in our own life journey that is, um, we're, we're, that's tough. Yeah. You know, we're always, we're always in that situation where faith we we you know our the faith that is a gift is something that we um have invitation after invitation to cling to yeah yeah so i don't know it's uh i that i was going to say that as well the um 
you know, it, especially in Mark of all Gospels, the messianic secret, which is Jesus continues to tell them, right? Don't, don't, don't say anything, anything. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. And all of a sudden, you get this angel. It's like, okay, you can go say and something. Say something. And they say nothing. And they say nothing. <laughs> They've been saying things the whole the whole time. time they can't the keep their mouths shut. And then all of a sudden, yeah. when they should say something, yeah, yeah, they're they're silent. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, well, I think that's great. And I yeah. think it's a great invitation. Um, you know, what will our next chapter be in the story of, right. of the resurrection? Right. And how will that story play out in our own lives right. and in our own relationships? Right. And I think it's a, a salient way to kind of wrap up on this particular Easter um, for our Easter Sunday, uh, both individually, but also as a community of faith, as Good Shepherd, Episcopal Church and School. Um, I'm really excited that I'm here and I'm looking forward to the next many decades yeah. of what God is, has in store for us. But I think this question um, will continue to be part of our journeys, right. both individually and corporately. So Love hang it. in there. Love it. Well, uh, as we said, it is Holy Week, so um, we hope to see you if you're listening to this um, before these services, Thursday, Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. in the church um, for feet washing and Eucharist and as well as the stripping of the altar. And then you can sign up to stay and pray in the church at, for, for an hour or more throughout that whole night from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. On Friday, we have uh, Stations of the Cross at noon and a youth-led Stations of Peter at 6 and then we have a Good Friday service with Tizé Music at 7 p.m. on Friday. And then it all climaxes, in my opinion, with mm -hmm. the Great Vigil of Easter on Saturday night at 8 p.m., which begins out in the prayer labyrinth uh, with the lighting of the new Paschal candle and then goes into the dark church. And then um, the first proclamation of Easter and the first Eucharist of Easter is celebrated there in the church on Saturday night. Uh, and then Sunday morning, the festive Sunday morning services at 6.30 a.m. in the um, outdoor chapel and 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. with an Easter egg hunt after that. So lots, lots happening. And uh, normally we say that we will see you on Sunday, but I hope to see you before Sunday at one of those services. It's great to have you listening today. We hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Um, and we hope to see you very soon for Holy Week as we approach the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord on Easter. We hope you feel a little more prepared to hear these words. See you later. Bye.